listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Good morning. Let us pray together for today's chapel worship. Living God, as we are gathered here today, we ask you to shower unto us your wisdom and knowledge. As we seek your purpose, inspire us to sing your praise with creativity and joy so that we can experience your kingdom here. And we pray that as we listen to your word, we may have the ability to clearly understand what you have called our community to do. Loving God, you called us to be in relationship with one another and promise to dwell wherever two or three are gathered. In our community, we are many different people. We come from different places, have many different gifts. It is your sovereign will that we be gathered together as one community in your holy name. Merciful God, fill our hearts with the fire of your love and with the desire to pursue justice for all. By sharing the grace and compassion you give us, may we secure an equality for all sacred individuals and communities throughout the world. Gracious God, we seek you and thank you in the midst of chaos. We ask, may there be an end to suffering, division, injustice, and disillusionment. May there be a dawning of a community of care built on love and peace. And may there be new possibilities of hope and resilience that are born of our faith in you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kristen Glover, and I am going to present our artistic expression this morning. It's my honor to share with you uh, Brittany Thornton, who is a MATM student here at Bright, who's created some artwork for our um, viewing this morning. And then Deshay Jackson will also be sharing a musical expression of that artwork. Uh, some themes we want you to notice in the artwork that you can uh, see is um, a goose, which is representing migration, angels, God's leading and providence, and a forest, which represents wilderness where most journey takes place, an unknown place, but where the Lord will provide. Um, on the second image, you may notice uh, a huge head representing Jacob and mankind of our scripture this morning, angels on stairs, which are divine interception and intervention. Identical angels and waters speak to the sanctioned ground, ordained and holy ground. There is a hand of God which proceeds into the image, presenting uh, God's presence and font, which is red presenting chaos and disorder. There is also some green emeralds which represent the rocky situation that may be of great value. Some questions we would like for you to think about as we view these images and listen to this musical expression this morning is, what would your chaos look like? How is God showing up for you amidst the chaos?
Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Bright Divinity School's Chapel Worship Experience. This space is designed as a space for all people to gather and authentically connect with God and worship together. We're so, so happy that you've joined us virtually on today. We're also so, so happy for everything that God is doing in the life of Bright. Today, I'm so pleased to um, introduce you to, or reintroduce you to, for some people, to our phenomenal worship leader musician for today. We have leading worship today, Deshay Jackson. William Deshay C. Jackson is a third year Master of Divinity student, a fourth generation disciple of Christ, and is seeking ordination with the Mid-American region of the Christian Church of Disciples of Christ. They earned a bachelor's degree in music education for, from Culver Stockton College with an emphasis in piano and voice. Outside of Culver Stockton, Deshay has performed with the Quincy Concert Band, Quincy Community Theater, Muddy River Opera Co um, Company in Quincy, Quincy, Illinois, Union Avenue Opera Company in St. Louis, Missouri, and a host of other venues and settings. Deshay has served as the choir director and pianist for, for Canton Christian Church in Canton, Missouri, music minister for St. Martin in the Fields Episcopal Church in Keller, Texas, and currently serves as the music of minister for, for First Christian Church in Grandsbury, Texas. Deshay also serves with the Bright Worship Planning Team. And lastly, Deshay loves sloths, jazz and aspires to be womanist co-conspirator. We're so, so grateful for Deshay's gifts and the way that they contribute to the ethos of Bright. Welcome Deshay Jackson. We're so happy to have you join us today and we're grateful for your presence. We hope that something will be said or done today to lean in closer to God. Again, welcome. Good morning. My name is Juni Mayanga. Uh, I'm a second year student at Bright Divinity School. Uh, Reverend Dr. Fred Rich was ordained a PCUSA minister in 1985 and served churches in Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland before coming to Fort Worth in 2004. He has been senior pastor at St. Stephen Presbyterian Church for 16 years. His wife, Margaret, teaches in Edward Morrow School of Strategic Communication at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. They have two children, Sarah and Benny, both of whom live in New Orleans. Dr. Rich has been deeply involved in addressing homeless in Tarrant County. He has served on the board of the Presbyterian Night Shelter, the Center for Transforming Lives and the continuum of care. He was chair of the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition Board and also chaired the Joint Government and Interagency Task Force that restructured how homeless services are coordinated in region. Dr. Rich, we are looking forward to hearing from you. When our 
Our city stand forsaken, and the poor must beg for bread. When the prisoner sits forgotten, and the homeless find no bed, God, we raise our lamentation. Waken justice from the dead. Raise a beauty from the ashes and our violence tend our peace. Give us vision of a future where all captives find release, where oppression is evicted, and all works of hatred Our lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures comes to us today from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Listen for the Word of God. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and set them across the stream and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is in the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket on the thigh muscle. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a young man, Jacob the patriarch was one of the least likable characters of the Bible, and friends, that is saying a lot. We are told his name means grabber because he was born grasping his brother Esau's heel, and from then on he was grasping throughout his whole life. As a young man, he disguised himself as Esau to trick his blind father Isaac into giving him his father's blessing. Jacob, now in the story we're reading, has the blessing and authority of the firstborn, and on top of that, he is now the official carrier of the Abrahamic blessing, God's promise of a great nation and of being a blessing to the whole world. How weird, how strangely chaotic it is that this flawed, arrogant, self-centered, manipulative jerk is God's vehicle for conveying Abraham's blessing to another generation. Now Jacob always thought he was clever. His style throughout his life was to trick and connive to get what he wanted. As a result, he spends a good deal of his young life on the run with his two wives and two maids, as they were called, and eleven children in tow. But, you know, life has a way of catching up with us, and it came to the point 
that Jacob realized for his sake, for his family's sake, that he had to settle down. He has run out of places to run, and so his eyes turn after two decades to home. That place where you can go and they have to take you in. Except that in Jacob's case, home doesn't want to take him in. Esau is now the lord of the manor. He has mobilized armed men to meet Jacob's unarmed party. Esau, who we are told was covered with red hair, was still red with rage two decades later. So the night before Jacob is to meet Esau, he is confronted by something. Some kind of supernatural force that has taken material form. What is it? Well, from Jacob's perspective, a demon is probably the safest assumption. So what do you do when you're confronted by a demon by the side of the river in the middle of the night? Well, duh, it's obvious if you're Jacob, you wrestle it. Now, Jacob has a lot going for him as a wrestler. Genesis tells us he was a man of great physical strength and athletic prowess. No doubt he was confident. Con men are often way too confident for their own good. And he is good. He is so good that he actually wrestles this supernatural being to a standstill. It looks like everything is going his way until the man or the demon or the god or whatever it is hauls off and hits him right in the hip socket. Now let's just stop there for a minute. This blow, this direct strike to the hip joint will end up crippling Jacob for life. In fact, it will come to symbolize his whole life from this point forward. Another way to translate Jacob is man who walks crookedly. As we will see through the remainder of Genesis, Jacob the grasper becomes Jacob the helpless. He who had striven so hard and with such purpose to have control over his own life will now find himself tossed and turned by events beyond his control. The role he assumes when given the name Israel, his destiny as father of a nation, has taken over completely. He doesn't control his own life. For better or for worse, from this point forward, God does. Now, his new name, Israel, means one who struggles with God and with humans. So, what we're being told here is that this angel, demon, human, God thing Jacob has wrestled with is really God in a skin suit. Wow. Really cosmic, right? But there's this thing, there's this one thing, there, this hip blow, there's a thing about that. It was illegal. Now, wrestling, wrestling has been around longer than any known sport. It was already well developed in the ancient world, even at the time of Jacob. Now, there are two things that we should know about wrestling from the get-go. Wrestling is a sport. It is not a fighting art. It can be used for fighting, but it is a sport. And except and unless you're watching the WWE, hitting is not allowed. The way you get over on your opponent in wrestling is by joint locks or by throws or takedowns or pins or choking. It is not by hitting. If you hit, you aren't wrestling anymore. You're fighting. And wrestling is a sport. It's not a fight. What I'm telling you, my friends, is that God cheated God cheated. Now, I have been invited here today to preach on the topic of order and chaos. But this 
one thing turns all our concepts of order and chaos completely on their heads. God cheats. God cheats all the time. Half the fun of the Jacob story is to see that Jacob may be a cheat, but God cheats more and is better at it. God cheats. But we don't like to say that about God, do we? Precisely because it does turn all our concepts of order and chaos on their heads. So we've come up with a nicer word that means the same thing. We call God cheating grace. But it comes to the same point, grace is God cheating. Now, if you're having a negative reaction to the idea that God cheats, it may be because you believe that God represents order. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. What order are we talking about? The created order? But that's broken. That's the biblical story. The created order is broken by human sin. Paul tells us in Romans 8, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but of the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. See, at the core of the premise about order and chaos are a bunch of assumptions. Right now, protesters are on the streets, a lot of you, I suspect, demanding justice in the endless, ungodly litany of black people killed by the police. You are demanding a new order. Some would say, following the passage from Romans that we just read, a new birth. A new birth. Now the people who want you to stop are screaming about law and order. They think that black people standing up for their rights and protesters on the street and people talking about defunding the police represent raw chaos. To them, order is the way things already are. Now, I don't want to mischaracterize their motives by any means, but the end result, if they have their way, would be that nothing would change. Surface changes, perhaps, but the, basic, the issue of institutional and systemic racism, ignored. Swept under the rug again. It's not real. America is not a racist country, I was told recently by a parishioner. Problem solved, unless you're a person of color. On the other side, I think it is safe to say our side. Order would be a nationwide movement to eradicate institutional and systemic racism. Now, I don't need to tell you that sometimes you have to destroy the old to create the new. That's old hat to us. You need a little chaos to create a better world order. Now, we all know that. But what that means is that we still want order. By nature, we think of order as the permanent state and chaos as the temporary state. When the necessary chaos is over, we expect to return to some new pattern of order. It doesn't matter if you're liberal or conservative, you, you have some concept of order, and you should. We should. Stability matters. It really does. But... But what if we're wrong? What if order is actually always disordered? What if order is actually chaos? Whether it's your order or my order, liberal order, conservative order, some other kind of order, 
it's actually disorder? What if it's always flawed? What if order is actually chaos? What if, if it's not systemic racism, then it's something else? And what if every time we have our revolution, we unconsciously institutionalize some new wrong? I spent several years doing community organizing, and I remember a sobering point made by our chief organizer once. He said, every great change that you make creates 20 new problems that didn't exist before. Every great change that you make creates 20 new problems that didn't exist before. Now, it doesn't mean you don't make the change. It just means don't imagine that you've reached the kingdom. Deal with the reality of this fallen world in which we live. Face it. I like Paul's analogy of childbirth, but I don't necessarily buy into the idea of that the birth of the reign of God is a one-time event. A mistaken reading of the Bible is that one day, way off in the future, God will upset the order of things with some kind of chaos and then bring about a new day, a new birth. That is such an orderly way for God to do things. It's like even chaos has its neat and orderly place right there at the end of history. In fact, the God of the Bible isn't neat or orderly at all. What Jesus taught us is that he came to proclaim the arrival of chaos. The chaos starts with him, the godly chaos of the day of judgment, the chaos of what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, the chaos of the reign of God. Now, I've been reading Torah scholars now because I've been reading Exodus a lot for my regular preaching. And rereading Paul while also studying the reflections of Torah scholars, I started to read his passage from Romans 8 differently, hopefully with a bit more of the imaginative thinking of the great rabbis. Right before Paul says that all creation has been straining in childbirth, he says, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, maybe the children of God aren't necessarily believers like you and me. Maybe what's meant by children of God is the constant birth of new ages, tiny births of new settlements of the reign of God dotting throughout history because the rise of the reign of God, the birth of the reign of God is constant. It is constant. See, that makes more sense to me because the reign of God is always being born. The chaos of God continually breaks the rules of this flawed order, cheating God's way into the world in ways that constantly undermine our assumptions and beliefs our institutions and our values, our flawed, inhuman, and ungodly systems and attitudes and structures, never mind our own lives. This is the dastardly Lord who comes like a thief in the night, who strikes with the surprise blow of a divine wrestler who likes to cheat. God is a lawless thief breaking into our ordered assumptions. God is a doping athlete who will do anything to win. Even, think about it, even this, the Lord who is born of an unwed mother, this God laughs at our idiotic rules, laughs at them. This God scoffs at them. God cheats. All our corrupt orders are exposed by God's persistent, unyielding, lawless cheating. The social order cries out, it would have worked if it wasn't for that meddling God. 
The reign of God is like the Scooby Gang. Right now, the movement for change is focused on new birth, the new creation that will come into the world as a result of all this. Now, my wife and I have been through pregnancy three times now, if you include one miscarriage. What you think is that the pregnancy and the childbirth and all that are kind of the brief chaotic eruption of a new life into the world, after which everything will settle into a new order with a bunch of new rules. But that is not, that is not how it works. In the first place, for Margaret and me, we had two kids spaced nearly six years apart. When our youngest was born, well, we thought, well, we've already got this down, right? We've been through this once. Wrong. <laughs> different kid, and you know, like they say, every kid is born into a different family. Right away, a bunch of new rules and expectations, just a bunch of rules and expectations just went out the window. There was this period where Margaret and I felt overwhelmed when the kids were f small. We felt like we needed some way to control things, so we started learning Adlerian parenting. It was pretty cool, by the way. I liked a lot about it. We focused on encouraging our kids. Natural and logical consequences. There were all kinds of things that we practiced, disciplines that we engaged in. There were hilarious in retrospect, attempts to use natural and logical consequences to teach our kids to adopt better behaviors and to learn independence. Some of them worked, some not so much. It was a lot of hard work. And I'm not saying it was useless, not at all, but that orderly approach to parenting didn't really change the actual chaos of parenting that much either. In her teens, we discovered that our talented, charismatic, and over-the-top daughter has bipolar disorder. The psychologist told her that she couldn't drink, she couldn't stay up late at night, she had to follow a whole lot of rules to keep herself stable and not swing over into a manic state or an extreme depression. We were told she couldn't even leave town to go to college. But she did. Her junior year, she went into a major depression and had to drop out for a semester, but she went back and she graduated. She also bucked against all the other rules the psychologist told her to abide by. She is a jazz singer and works in restaurant and entertainment management now in New Orleans. Everything happens at night. <laughs> a sleep schedule? Please. Her psychologist would have just freaked out over all of this, but she is happy and healthy and successful. But honest to God, it is never, ever a dull moment with her. And I'm not going to pretend we rest easy with it, but it is what it is. When we were raising our kids, we had all kinds of rules, all kinds of expectations, what we expected it all to look like. We imagined an order to all of it. Now, all that has gone to hell in a handbasket. It is chaotic and completely unpredictable, and there's no point even in trying to control any of it. It's nothing like what we could have expected or imagined. But we wouldn't trade a minute. Not one single minute. And that's the reign of God, too. Once it is born, God has unleashed chaos on the world. All our plans are out the window. You know, there is one thing we ultimately learned as parents. It's hardly a revolutionary insight. You realize that past a certain point, you just need to surrender control. At that point, you realize that all that is left, all that matters, 
is love. But love is really all that really matters. And that, too, is the way that the reign of God works. In fact, love is the reign of God. Love of enemies, which is frankly as countercultural and counterintuitive as you can possibly get. Forgiveness, which carried through to its logical conclusion, is a force that can turn society upside down and has in places like South Africa. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. You remember, that's the issue for Jacob. We're back to him now. The day after he wrestles the whatever at the Jabbok, he is supposed to meet his brother Esau. At risk is not just his life, not just his family's life, but actually the promise itself. God's promise to bless the world through his family. If Jacob cannot rise to this occasion, all will be lost. God knows why God chose Jacob, of all people, to do this job. But the Jacob who meets his brother is a changed man. Jacob's days of physical prowess are gone forever. So, too, is his arrogance his deceitfulness. Esau, ready for a fight, instead embraces him. If Jacob and Esau can reconcile, God really can do miracles. Our orderly constructs give us the false notion that our society or our little group already knows how to love and practice forgiveness or to be reconciled. We know it because we're doing it right now with what we stand for, right? We're we're showing love to those who need it the most. That's what this movement is all about. Yes, absolutely, but let us be careful, friends. Be wary of the lie we tell ourselves. In our decided, in our divided society, We have decided that we are on the side of good and they are on the side of evil. They are demons we are wrestling. The embodiment of evil in blue uniforms or pickup trucks with guns or serving in elected office. And we also don't tolerate the people in the middle ground, the ones who are unsure, the ones who want to do right but are confused, the ones, by the way, in our pews, in our churches, And then we excuse our lack of love by saying it is not appropriate to the moment we are in. Maybe later when all this is passed, right now, we're in a crisis. Friends, we're always in a crisis. We've always been in a crisis. The so-called order of the world we live in really is chaos. The reign of God has been trying to burst forth from the moment Jesus popped squalling out of his mother's womb. Jesus didn't tell us to love and forgive and be reconcilers except when we're in the apocalypse. Love of enemies and forgiveness and reconciliation are the values he expects us to practice in the apocalypse. Love of enemies and forgiveness and reconciliation are the inbreaking reign of God. They are the way that God is cheating God's way into the world. And a clue that they're God's message is our own insistence that they are not appropriate right now. No, they are not orderly at all. I've tried to tell people on my side that I love the people on the other side too. And they don't get it. They often feel like I'm betraying them I'm talking about my own children here, by the way, who are out on the front lines protesting in New Orleans where the cops fight dirty. My kids feel like this is not the right time to talk about loving your enemies. I hear them. Love and forgiveness and reconciliation just don't make sense right now. They seem disorderly, maybe even unfaithful. Well, they are never orderly. Love and forgiveness and reconciliation are chaotic and confusing and upsetting. They don't make sense. 
That is precisely how we know that they are what God expects of us. But how we practice that love, what it looks like right at this moment with these people in this situation, well, I'm not sure I can really tell you. Just like I can't tell you precisely how I need to love my children in any given situation at any given time, or even if loving them means that I'm doing the actually the best thing. All I know is that I do love them with all the chaos and joy that that brings. I love them. And God loves us. Flawed and confused and misguided as we are, God loves us. And in spite of us, and yet mysteriously, and in God's gracious, chaotic manner through us, God is working out the tikkun alom, the healing of the world, through us. Just like God worked it out through (laughs) Jacob. That's our hope. If that crazy, chaotic God can work it out through Jacob, then hell, certainly God can use you and me. Strong, gentle children, God made you beautiful, gave you the wisdom, the power you need. Speak in the stillness, know you are longing for. Live out your calling to love and to lead. Strong hurting children, angry and terrified. Open the secrets your life has concealed. Though you are wounded, know you are not to blame. Cry out your story till truth is revealed. Strong knowing children, utter your cry aloud. Honor the wisdom God gave you at birth. Speak to your elders, know they have heard your voice. Sing out your vision of healing on earth. I invite you to think of our communion today as being um, an invitation to accept the symbolic nature of so many things that are happening right now. We just heard a phenomenal sermon this morning about chaos and the work that God does even in the midst of chaos. So this morning I invite you to allow the bread to symbolize the beauty of chaos and the wine or juice may symbolize our invitation to to the newness that is birthed even in chaos. Today we also remember the life of Jesus and the gift of remembrance that he left with his disciples. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given 
for you. Eat it, all of you. Likewise, he took the cup and he said, after giving thanks, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for you. Drink all of it, all of you. God, we're so grateful for you doing your best work, even in chaos. We're grateful for the life of Jesus and the work that he did to remind us that this world um, is ours to create, to bring about a new thing. So God, thank you so much for the work that you have done on this morning through our sermon, through this worship experience to, to nudge us and bring us closer to you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. We want to invite you to join us today, immediately after our service, to join us for our community conversation. We will have an opportunity to visit with uh, Reverend Ritzy and uh, to discuss um, further about the amazing things that he's uh, letting us know about the opportunities to create in our lives. We all also invite you to uh, join us on Wednesday at 12.15 for our Epi Epi Episcopal Eucharist and uh, on Thursday uh, for a bright um, community uh, coffee hour. And this coming week, as you know, we will be taking some reading time, but we will encourage you to join us for our prayer service Tuesday at 11 in the morning. And of course, you know that Shili Kukov is going on online on October 19. And our virtual happy hour will happen on October 16 at 6 p.m. And we will also be having a Netflix watch party on October 30th at 7. We really hope to see you join us in any or all of these activities so we can continue to build community. Thank you. Amen. Well, my heart is so overjoyed with the sermon that Reverend Rich preached this morning that is really a reminder that God has always been present, even when it looks like all hope is lost and it looks like things can't be even more chaotic. God is still doing God's best work. God is still working in and through us to do a new thing. So I'm happy this morning that that invitation has been laid for us to co-create with God in this way, in this season. Thank you again, Reverend Rich, for that beautiful, beautiful sermon. And I'll be laughing at many of those jokes that you said this morning for I'm sure days to come. Also, thank you, Deshae Jackson, for leading worship with us this morning. What a beautiful worship experience. Thank you to all of those who lead with Bright's worship planning team. It's only because of you that this work is able to be done on Tuesdays. Finally, thank you to all of you who worshiped with us on this morning. We're so, so happy that you continue to support the Bright community and we look forward to seeing you in all of our community events throughout the week. Now on to you, oh God, who's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless in your presence to the one and only wise, majestic God, here, now, and forevermore. Amen.